All right, well, what a powerful song that we get to dig in today as we are gonna go through every single word of that powerful song on living hope that we get to uh, see the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ today. So to give you a little picture of what we're doing in the church right now, last week we talked about the simple gospel. So even if you weren't here, you can still repeat after me. This is the simple gospel. We were but God by grace. And so last week we tried to take the gospel and really make it as simple as we possibly could because one of the things that we do as human beings and as the church is we make the gospel difficult sometimes and it shouldn't be. The gospel is one of the most simple gifts that we can ever receive and the message, it was paid by a great price but it's a simple gospel. Today we're gonna look at the bridge illustration. Um, By any chance, were any of you a part of the Navigator's ministry at any time? Anybody here with the Navigators? Well, nobody was in the first service either. And uh, the good news is maybe I'll get a chance to share you uh, a, a fresh expression of this bridge. And my challenge for you today is maybe you have seen this bridge illustration many times, or maybe it's the first time. If it's the first time, I'm so excited to share with you the gospel that's a little bit more complicated the way we're gonna explain it than last week, but it's not gonna be as difficult as next week. Next week, we are gonna dig into the historical parallel between the words of the Apostle Paul and historical Roman adoption. And we're gonna show you some of the legal matters that is spoken of in scripture of how we go from orphans to heirs, that we go to slaves to sin to firstborn heirs of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And so next week, we're gonna go one step further, but I wanna have these weeks as basis to allow us to get into really understanding the deep theological um, basis of our entire faith of gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, we're gonna be here in the middle, and then we're gonna go on Sign Up Sunday, we're gonna be in James chapter one, verse one, and we're gonna talk about faith in action and what it means to live out the good news of Jesus. If you click on that one more time, it will all come back on. All right, there we go. Um, And so that's gonna be the good news that we get a chance to step into. Uh, As we look at this week, we are gonna be in living hope. And so Father, Lord, we pray that you just uh, speak into this moment, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit is present here. Um, Lord, even though we have put time and preparation into this message, Lord, uh, we give you permission, Lord, to mess with us and change it according to you. Um, Lord, I pray that what people hear right now is, is so much more impactful than any words that I say. Holy Spirit, come and speak to our lives as we are here in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Phil Wickham has shared that his heart behind writing this song, uh, Living Hope, uh, was that he wanted to have a declaration of Jesus being the hope that is alive and active in our lives today. So as we look at James, we talk about living out the good news of Jesus, it's taking the gospel and we live out from there. Over the next two weeks, I would encourage you to read through the, the, the book of James. It's not a long book. So as we go into the weeks that we look at it section by section, you know in your mind the entire book of James and you can understand the context of it. Today we're gonna look at this song and the first thing is if you're taking notes and thanks to Brian for helping me write this message and helping me with some of these points. The first one is the chasm we couldn't cross. The chasm we couldn't cross. And and I love that, that play on words there as we get into what this means. And verse one is, just gonna look at the song that we sang. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. This song starts by by painting this picture of this huge chasm that separates us from God. So we go back to last week, the, the we were. We were separated from God because of our sins. We all have felt that distance. The the mountain that stands between you and God, it's too high that you cannot cross it. It's too far that you cannot cross it. It's too deep, you cannot go over it, that there's this separation between us and God that we feel separated from God. But in those moments, this song invites us to turn to God and guess what, when we do, we have a God who can hear us. And we're not just in this place of desperation, but we know that God isn't our last resort, but it's the best move that we can make. 
So we look at this and we look at the first step. The first step we're gonna focus on is actually God. So what I've done with this uh, illustration on the screen, I've literally taken the PDF from the Navigators and I pulled it into PowerPoint, I took it and I covered it with a bunch of white boxes that are all over the place and we're gonna gradually uncover them. So if you have the app today or during the week and you wanna come back to this, I've got the PDF of this entire illustration from the Navigators Every verse in question we're gonna look at is gonna be in the app so you can pull it up and look at it. So if you wanna take notes now, you can, or this is a resource you can go get. And like I said, there's gonna be a couple different ways people are gonna receive this message. For some of you, this is gonna be new. You've never seen this. If that's the case, then sit back, let God speak to you, and listen to this wonderful illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those of you who have maybe seen this before, you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, I would strongly encourage you, if you've ever wanna know like how to share the gospel with people, to memorize these verses and even going as far as practicing, uh, just think about it, all you need is a cocktail napkin and a pen and you can share the good news of Jesus people. And I love the fact that the context of where you can do that is anywhere. And so that's the two ways that we'll receive this message today. So we start off by understanding our relationship with God and that we are separated from God from this great chasm that was spoken of in our song. So let's begin by looking at John 3, 16. Now the reality is we could actually do this entire illustration by just using John 3, 16. The navigators have that tool you can find. But we're gonna look at some other verses as well today to give us a deeper understanding. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So what does this tell us about God? What this tells us about God is that God loves us, that God wants to give us eternal life. So that's what John 3, 16, there's more to it, but we're gonna focus on that. That God loves you, and he wants you to experience eternal life. But what kind of life does God want for you today? Well, John 10, 10 says that thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus declares, that they may have life, they may have it more abundantly, they may have life to the full. So we go back to understanding on the bridge that God loves you and that God's plan for you is to have abundant life with a purpose, an impact, to have meaning to your life. He wants you to have a life of peace, joy, love, and acceptance. And so that's gonna be our understanding of who God is in this story. The second thing is we're gonna look at our problem, that we do have a problem with this, and that is the chasm that separates us from God. We have a problem that we can't fix on our own. It begins with a problem called the sin problem. In Romans 3, 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so what's humanity's problem that we see in this? The problem is that all have sinned. All of, us, uh, all of us have sinned. Like an arrow missing its target, we fall short of God's intent for us. That all of us have done what we should not do and we're left undone what perhaps we should have done. And so what is the result? The result is the chasm. That we are separated from God. That we cannot reach God. There's nothing that we can do to get across this chasm. So I think about the song that we sang, how great the chasm that lay between us. So let's look at Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the wages, if you think about the context here is when you go to work and you do a job, you have earned the wages, so you earn what you receive but also we can see this context in regards to our sins. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, that what we have earned because of our life, because of our choices, because we cannot ever live up to God's perfect standard, that what we earn from that, what we deserve from that, is that we deserve to receive not just death physically at the end of our life, but also a spiritual death that our souls are separated from God for all of eternity. The wages of sin is death. You know, we we continue in Hebrews nine, and it says, and as it is appointed for men to die once, 
But after this, the judgment. So what happens after we die? We face judgment for the sins we commit. What I find so interesting is that people so often, they think of their relationship with God as always being focused on getting into heaven. And yes, that is the beginning of our salvation, is that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and our sins are forgiven, that our names are written in the book of life and we earn the right to be called his own and that we receive eternal life, that we can stand with God, not just in a living hope for today, but in a living hope that we can stand with God for all of eternity. But the one thing, church, that I want us to also understand is that our goal for you to be a disciple of Jesus is not just to get you into heaven, but we want you to live out the good news of Jesus, that God has given you eternal life, he has given you salvation, and he's called us to be on his team to be a part of his great purpose. And so one of the things that's interesting in being a pastor in Central Florida is I see a different perspective on this at times. I, I talk to people about, you know, you know, the relationship with Jesus. And then, of course, they find out I'm a pastor and they want to tell me their church background. And a lot of people have told me, like, oh, I don't go to church anymore, but I got a perfect attendance award in Sunday school um, when I was a kid, so I know me and God are cool. And I was like, well, you know, the reality is, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you've asked him to forgive you for your sins, I do believe that you have received his salvation and that God will not let go of those that he holds in his hands. Yes, I believe that. But what was different was when I was out in California and I was in a small town up in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains is I actually lived in a town that most people's grandparents didn't go to church and their parents didn't go to church where you move to central Florida and everybody has an uncle who was a Southern Baptist preacher or something, right? And so a lot of people here have grown up with church and perhaps they've even been hurt by the church They've received some teachings that actually weren't true and it's distorted their relationship with God. And because of that, they've chosen not to engage with a church community within the body of Christ. Where when we were out in California, we literally were like, people were like, yeah, I've heard of Jesus. He seemed like he taught good stuff. He was about love, but the church seems kind of judgmental. So we've never been a part of it. And we would get a chance to cook them breakfast on Sunday mornings, cook them dinner on Wednesday nights. We had a clothing pantry. We had a food pantry. We were serving a rather poor community. And we got a chance to really engage in mission and earn the right to share the gospel. And then we would share the gospel with people and they're like, well, this isn't what I thought God was. This is awesome. And they would receive it and they didn't have the baggage. And it was a beautiful thing to be a part of where now I have conversations with people and they'll say, yeah, you know, back when I was in Maryland, back when I was in Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, you know, we were a part of our church for 40 years and, and we were a deacon and then my husband became an elder, um, but now we're retired and we don't go to church anymore. And I'm not joking, it's a conversation I have often. And I'm like, well, that's not the goal. The goal is not just to, to, to punch your ticket into heaven and then to say, well, we did that for a while, now we're retired, but God has a purpose for us and that God wants us to not just get into heaven, but be engaged in now taking things and sharing the gospel with others. And that's why today we wanna to empower you by learning these tools on how we can share the good news of Jesus with other people. And so, you know, the reality is we try to build our bridges to church. And so we, we do things like we try to think that church attendance is gonna get us in, that community service is gonna get us there. Maybe you heard a sermon, they said, if you tithe more, you'll get a better house in heaven. The Bible doesn't say that, but you know, they, they've preached that sermon. You know, or perhaps you thought if you just became a monk and left the situation that all of a sudden it would just be much easier. You know, but that's not the call that God has put on our lives, that he wants us to have a relationship with him. And I do wanna say that if you feel like the church has let you down on behalf of a person who's been pretty employed by the church for most of my adult life, I am sorry for that. And I know that I learned something. When I was, uh, I was asked to speak to the middle school um, at our church in Columbus one time, uh, the middle school group of a very large church, when all this bad stuff was happening in church leadership that was all over the news, they said, Kevin, when you speak on all these things that are happening in the church. And we had different church leaders who were being convicted for things in our local community that was very prominent. So I walked up in front of, you know, 150 middle school kids and I, they asked me to talk about this issue. And I just walked up and said, hey guys, I want you to know something. The church is full of people and people are sinful. 
And because of that, we see brokenness in the church. Let me tell you what the church is supposed to be. And that's where I went from there. So if you've been hurt, I apologize. The church is full of people and people are sinful. As we look at the hope and the darkness, the second point that we have, the hope and the darkness. And I find this, this is such a fun uh, song to sing because they've got pre-choruses and chorus and pre-choruses and the energy just keeps on crescendoing. And so here we are in a pre-chorus one. And then it says, then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Now, if I may, for just a moment, I want us to be comfortable to sit in the darkness. It said, through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. So as I was praying about this and I was looking at this text, it, it brought me to another song. As I was preparing for Amazing Grace, I watched a lot of videos about the, the hymns of the faith. And so another one that I actually got drawn into frequently here in the past few weeks was one that maybe you've heard called It Is Well. It was written by Horatio Spafford. You can see a picture of him and some of his daughters, uh, their home outside Chicago, Illinois. Um, and so they experienced early in their life some tragedy that uh, they had the loss of their son. The, their fortune began to grow though and they began to increase and he owned more. He was a lawyer, but he was able to become very successful in real estate. And so he invested on a lot of properties, increasingly a, a across the Michigan Avenue shoreline. And as 1871 continued, we became to 1873. Some of you know the song and the story of the great Chicago fire. And so if you actually look at this famous painting, uh, painting of the Chicago fire, what's interesting is the one thing that I either heard or read is that perhaps a third of all the buildings that you see in this painting were owned by Horatio. That this was like the area that he had most of his wealth. And so literally you can see his entire wealth almost up in flames at this time. And so they went from the loss of a child to the loss of so much of their wealth. Now, if you know the rest of the story, apparently he still was doing okay because he gets his wife and his four daughters and he says, I'll tell you what, we're gonna rebuild Chicago, but he sends them out to Europe just to get away. And so they had a plan to go to London and then go to Paris and to spend some time away while they were rebuilding their home rebuilding their life in Chicago. Well, he still had some deals that he had to work on, so he gets his wife and daughters and he sends them on a, a luxury liner and sends them across the ocean. During that time on November 21 of 1873, the luxury cru cruise liner was accidentally rammed by a British Iron Hall sailing ship. And when the ship comes and just by accident uh, runs into this other ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it sinks within, they said, 12 minutes. Within 12 minutes, the entire boat sank. Because of that, the wife was able to swim enough to be, be rescued by the boat that actually ran into them. But then that boat sank within hours and another boat had to come and rescue everybody that was there. But unfortunately, in the cold waters of the North Atlantic, all four of Horatio's daughters um, went under the sea and died in that moment. So here he was, and, and he was, at this time, of course, you know, it took time for him to get the news. Um, but all of a sudden, he received a telegram, and it was from his wife, who at this point had arrived in Wales, and she wrote this note that we still have today, and you can see it kind of right there in the middle. Saved alone, what shall I do? Saved alone, what shall I do? So Horatio immediately sent a message back to her, just stay there, I'll come to you. And so he gets on a boat and he's going across the Atlantic. And one night, the captain of the boat came and knocked on his door and said, Horatio, we are, we are coming to the place where your daughters passed, essentially over the tomb of his daughters. And so he, he goes out and he looks at the waters of the Atlantic over the very spot where he was there his half-sister was actually with him, and he had said these words, on Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down, where my, where my daughters went down. In mid-ocean, the waters were three miles deep, but I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe 
folded in the dear lamb's arms. So he said that, and then the captain reports, he got a piece of paper out, and he began to write a song. And he wrote on this piece of paper that's been preserved, he wrote the great hymn of the faith, It Is Well. He said these words, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So I think about how can a person look into this moment of life, a person who had so much blessing but also so much tragedy, and he can look in that moment and look at those waters. And by the way, I will never sing that song the same way when it says, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Recognizing the tragedy in those waters, he still could say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How, how does a person do that? And I go back to living hope. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And the reality is my doubt and my questions probably challenges my faith because Horatio is able to look at the world of today and know that it was only a, a blot on the map for eternity. He knew the story had been written. The end was accomplished and his living hope was not in his daughters or his son or in his wealth, but it was in the living hope that Jesus Christ had provided salvation for each and every one of his family members. And he knew that their hope and their belief was in Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of that tragedy, he could declare that Jesus Christ gave him hope. In John 8, it says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Friday night, we were able to have this, uh, this board up for, for, we had a black light on it. We should have brought one in this morning because it really makes it pop. And uh, it's got the, the you are the light of the world on it. And we were able to write our names on it. And I love that I see Elliot's name and Ray's name and Mason's name nice and big here so that everybody could see it. Uh, and my name's on there. I think Brian's on there too. And we all got a chance to write our names on that. The good news that we have in Jesus is as we walk into a world that is broken. And of course, the biggest thing that we hear, the biggest obstacle to people understanding Jesus Christ as their living hope is when they've had tragedy in their lives. They've had difficulties in their life. And they say, Kevin, if God is all powerful and God is all loving, then why? Why has this happened? How can we have living hope in the midst of tragedy? The good news is that we can be the light of the world, that we can share the good news of Jesus, that even amidst tragedy, the hope that we can have in Jesus is that the end has been written. The work is finished and Jesus Christ is my living hope today. He's my living hope for tomorrow and he's my living hope for eternity. So even if things in this world may not go according to what we design and what we have planned, that we can have that living hope. And I'm so thankful that God is doing that work. And so one of my greatest joys was just seeing the kids fill this on Friday night, but also something that happened Friday earlier in the day. And I gave Brady a heads up, I was gonna be talking about him. And one of my greatest joys was Friday late morning, um, I received a text from the young man in our church, Brady Hart, who's back here. And it was his first game of the year, a preseason game. And he's got a big thing of, life's all ahead of him. He could have been so focused on himself on that day, thinking about the game plan, looking at plays, talking to wide receivers, all focused on that. But he drove down, and we're not very close to Coco High, but he drove from his home here before going up for the game. And he texted, hey, can I get some Bibles? before going. Because in the midst of all the teams that we all have fun cheering for, and what's, we cheer against each other sometimes, we cheer with each other some fun, sometimes. All the games of life that we get a chance to talk of, on that day, the first day of the year, the thing that I was so touched by was that the focus he was on was bringing people to be a part of the team of Jesus. And so he came here and we were able to hand him Bibles and he was able to get, we have these leather ones out there that's the story of Jesus all put into a nice, easy to read story. We gave devotionals. 
And then Brady called together in the cafeteria of Coco to an invitation for the players who wanted to come. And many of the players did. And even some of the coaches looked in. And he got to share the living hope of Jesus Christ. Where it could have been so easy to justify being focused on ourselves and winning a game, which by the way, they definitely won the game. And I was thinking of the illustration, did you get tackled or touched the entire game? No, I, I watched it after because I was doing the dance. He didn't get touched the entire game and stats were better than I could do on Madden. And it was awesome. Yes, they won the game, but I also can see that the focus he had to start that day. And when he called me afterwards, I asked him some of the stats, but he was sharing with me the joy of talking about Jesus with his tim- teammates. You see, church, we have this living hope. The gospel is simple. And sometimes we are so afraid to share it, but it's such a simple living hope that we have the opportunity to share. I wanna get back into understanding this story. Ephesians 2 from last week. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Can our best efforts bring the separation between us and God? No. We are saved by grace, which is the unmerited love of God. Good works will never be enough. If you're taking notes in the bulletin, it says, the mercy and the grace of God. We see in verse two, it says, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Ephesians two, also from our verses last week, it says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. You see, we can't even begin to imagine the mercy that God has shown for us. It is so great that it's beyond anything that we can fathom, we declare in this song. That Jesus took our sin, our shame, and he did it out of pure boundless grace and love for us, his mercy for us. He stepped down out of heaven, out of the glory of heaven to walk in our shoes and to take our place. This isn't some abstract idea. This is personal. It's Jesus saying, I've got you and I can take care of all of this. The next thing, if you're taking notes, is the power of the cross. We see in the the pre-chorus too, the cross has spoken I am forgiven. The king of kings calls me his own. Beautiful savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. First Corinthians, the apostle Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When you're falling down that chasm, it, it's foolishness. But when you recognize that the cross is our foundation and it allows us to get to God. It becomes the power saving grace of God. So we look at point three here and that's God's solution. We can't build a bridge to God. There's nothing that you can do to build a bridge to God. I want you to understand that this bridge of the cross was built by God. This isn't us building a way to get to God. It was God building a way to get to us. That's how great his love is for us. And it says in Romans, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love the phrase, Christ never died for a single righteous person, but he died for many sinners. He died for us while we were yet sinners. And what that means is the way that this bridge is designed is that we don't have to get ourselves fixed up. You don't have to get yourself cleaned up. You don't have to get over your hurts, your habits, your hangups, your addictions. You don't have to get over your hurt. That God will build the bridge to you while you are yet sinners. He will come to you. So if you know what you maybe even did last night or God knows what you did last summer, whatever it is, that God knows and he still builds the bridge to come to you. That's the good news of Jesus. That's his solution. His solution is nothing that you need to do. He says, I've got this and I can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. 
First Peter tells us this, and this is the apostle Peter. Peter from the disciple of Jesus saying, for Christ also suffered once for our sins. The lamb didn't have to be sacrificed time and time again. Once for our sins, the just died for the unjust that he might bring us to God. That's it, I'm not making this up. This isn't an illustration that I'm making up. This is the gospel, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Why is Jesus dying on the cross and rising again such good news for us? It's because it allows us to be with the God and Father who designed us in his image. It allows us to have the living hope of Jesus for this week, because some of you this week have needed to hear the good news of Jesus. You've needed to know that he is your living savior today, not just when you die, but you need Jesus to live by so that you're ready for him the day that you die. But we need our living hope each and every day. It allows us to know that Jesus conquered both our sin and our death by dying and rising again. This is the Christian gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. The cross has the final word. It's like a declaration from God saying, you're forgiven, you're mine, and nothing can change that. All you've gotta do is walk across the bridge that I have given for you. You see, we often forget that the king of kings calls us his own. We're not just followers, we're family. And that changes everything. Next week, we're gonna dig into what it meant for a slave child, a slave child to be all of his debts paid, to be made free, to stand in front of a magistrate and become the firstborn heir of a Roman citizen. And we're gonna really dig into the nitty gritty to show you how beautiful, and it, what it does is it shows you how far off from God we were, but also it's gonna give you a deep appreciation of what it means that you are not just a child of God, but you are given the right to be the firstborn heir of God in all of his kingdom. And that gives us the right to call him Abba Father as we are adopted children. That's gonna be the death that we go into next week. Point five, if you're taking notes, the victory over death. As we go into verse three, the victory over death. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. When I heard that this morning on the way here, I just was wondering what that looked like. And I don't know, you know, was it like where Jesus was lying there and then on day three when God declared that all had been completed, um, that in that moment he was like, a, <gasps> and all of a sudden he was like, hey, get that rock out of the way. I got to get back to work. I wanna go see my people. I know Mary's gonna be there waiting for me and I wanna go greet her. You know, or I don't know how else it could have happened. Tell me afterwards how you think it could have happened. You know, but just that beauty, he began to breathe. And I know this song is written well, the words are good, but Asa, thank you for giving your passion to sing it so well. Out of the science, out of the silence, the, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. You see, that's living hope. It's the good news that is there for us the day that we die and it's there for us every moment that we live, even in the midst of tragedy, but also in the balance of, of the good times too. That it keeps us centered on being recognized that we stand on the good news of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, and so we need not fear death. We need not fear tomorrow. We need not fear sickness. We need not fear calamity. Do we have hurt and sadness in our life? Absolutely. We have a Lord who wept knowing he could still resurrect from the dead. He wept for his friend Lazarus when he died. We have a Lord who is there for you. His heart breaks when your heart breaks. He understands there and he's with you on those difficult days, but we also can trust him with the victory. You see, as we focus on the resurrection, the moment that changed everything, when Jesus rose from the dead, he proved that death doesn't have the final say. And finally, we go to the final point, responding in worship. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. 
hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in whose name? In Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. In Psalm 95, David wrote, come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So as we finalize the bridge here, what is our response? You see, each of us needs to respond. Some people think that if they just don't come to church, they're exempt from this question. But all people will be called according to God's judgment. If not today, in eternity, and they'll be asked the question of, what did you do with my son, Jesus? In John 1, it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Stay tuned next week for more on that. To those who believe in his name, how do we become a child of God? We believe in the power of the name of Jesus. We declare that he is our living hope. And then in Revelation, this is Jesus speaking through um, the apostle John. And he says this in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, the voice of Jesus, and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he will be with me. What is Jesus trying to show us here when he offers to come in and eat with you? It means that he wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't say, open the door and I will come in and I will command you. It doesn't say those things. It says, let me come in and eat with you. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And maybe that's the part of this gospel that you're gonna be called to share with a neighbor, a coworker, a teammate. Jesus doesn't wanna come in and, and make you um, feel like you're not good enough. He wants to come and give you life and he wants to give you an abundant life. He wants to tell you, my cup runneth over for you. You're always welcome at my table. So we've been focused here these last couple weeks on making the gospel um, simple. And so let's end with our ABCs as I, as I invite the worship team to come back up. See, the ABCs of the gospel is that we admit that we are a sinner. And because of that, we are in need of a savior. And that we ask God to forgive us and to help us turn from our sins. The good news of the gospel is, he doesn't make you better, he makes you new. He doesn't come into your life and say, okay, now we're gonna slowly, mold. no, he gives you a new heart. He gives you a new understanding as this Holy Spirit comes into you. We believe that Jesus died for you and he rose again, conquering sin and death. Then we choose to commit your life to following Jesus, putting your total trust in him, and giving him the decision-making authority as the Lord of your life. So you can talk to Jesus right now. You can call upon the name that is above all names. You can call upon the name, the only name that can give us living hope. Because I know some of you, you need that living hope right now. Maybe you have your own situation, and it's not the same as Horatio's, but you've got your own hurt in your life right now. And you need to declare that Jesus Christ is your living hope, that even in the midst of tears, even in the midst of hardship, we can declare it is well. Because the lion has come out of the grave and he has declared that we can be free in him. Church, if you would stand as we come to the Lord in prayer, let's stand before him. If you are ready to receive Jesus, to declare him Lord of your life. Say this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I know that I am a sinner and I need you to forgive me. I know that your son Jesus died a painful death, but you paid the price for my sin. You rose again so that my sin could be washed clean. I could be forgiven in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I wanna make you the Lord of my life. And I will trust you, I will believe in you, and I will put my faith in you every day of this life until I stand before you for all of eternity. Everything I have is yours now. 
And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, we'll be up front. We'd love to pray with you as we come back to this song one more time and declare he's our living hope. Come on, let's all sing this together. We sung it once before, but let's really lift up our voices together as we sing this and really give him praise. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke a name into the night Don't